Howdy, I'm Michael Perch, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I teach and conduct research on data science, data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. Now, I share all my educational content with anyone. I share it all online. And I've built out a lot of interactive Python dashboards to teach fundamental concepts in data science. And so I realized I get a lot of questions about these, and my students do enjoy using them. I thought it'd be useful to put together a bunch of recorded walkthroughs of these dashboards. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to talk about the central limit theorem, a CLT. Everybody talks about the central limit theorem, and the best way to learn it is to play around with it, to observe it firsthand. If you'd like to follow along, you can go ahead and go to my GitHub account. I'm the Geostats guy. And if you go to Python Numerical Demos repository, you're going to find all of my interactive workflows down here. And so right about here, central limit there. Go ahead and download that. I've just updated it. It looks pretty cool. This is what it looks like if you open it up. And go ahead and do a kernel restart run all. Then we're all on equal footing. We're ready to go. Now, the purpose of this walkthrough is not to cover the theory. So the goal is to just kind of demonstrate it. I'll give some basic concepts up front. But if you want the full lecture on this, go ahead and check out within my parametric distributions lecture, I discuss the central limit theorem. That's part of my data analytics and geostats course. I also have discussions and lectures that cover univariate statistics. We'll be doing that, Monte Carlo simulation, and even distribution transformations if you want to see examples of, say, Gaussian anamorphosis, transforming a distribution to be Gaussian. Okay, let's go ahead and start out by defining the central limit theorem. The summation of independent random variables will approach Gaussian distributed as the number of random variables is large, becomes large. And what's really cool about this is there's no assumption or requirement with regard to the distribution of each one of the individual random variables. They could be any distribution shape, but the summation will tend towards Gaussian. The same for averaging. I say summation, but of course, if you do an average, it's just taking a summation and dividing it by the number of of samples in the summation. That's an average. So you get the same effect for averaging. Now let's go ahead and describe the same thing that I just mentioned with mathematical notation. Okay, so it's convenient to state that if we have x i, where i is equal to 1 through m, and we'll assume m is large or getting large, that's going to be all of our individual random variables, the x's. And the summation of those is y, and we set the limit as m approaches infinity, y will be distributed as n, in indicating normal, a normal distribution. Uh, that symbol there means distributed as. Okay, so if we go ahead and we can calculate the expectation of this, and the statistical expectation is not too hard to calculate. We take the statistical expectation of this summation of the xi's. Expectation is a linear operator, so it turns out we can go ahead and pull it in here and take it as the expectation of the sum is equal to the sum of the expectation. And so we just need the sum, the expected values of all of the xi's, and that will be our expected value of y. So we know it's how it'll be centered. We're just basically summing all of the mean values of all of the x's. The variance, well, variances are additive. As long as we have independence between the random variables, they're just additive. If, if we have mm, no, a relationship between them, now we have to start considering covariance terms. But we don't have to do that here if they're independent. Therefore, we can declare that our y will be distributed as m is large enough, Gaussian distributed, normal, with a mean, the summation of all the means, and a variance, the summation of all the variances of each of them. Okay, so that's, that's not too difficult. We, can, we know the distribution we should approach as long as m is large enough, and we'll show that to you. We'll show that. Now, what if all of the xi's have the same mean and variance? Well, that notation can simplify, and I hope from looking at the above, you can realize now 
that all we have to do is take m times the mean. So if we're assuming a constant mean, and I show that as mu, I know that's population mean, but I'm just indicating a constant mean. And the variance x, all we have to do is take m times the mean, m times the variance, and that's the variance, and that's the mean. That's the Gaussian distribution specified by mean and variance. What if we have repeated this, but now we're considering averaging? Well, averaging isn't too bad. We're just adding this additional term of 1 divided by the number of random variables, 1 divided by m. And you can. it would be very straightforward to just go back to the previous calculations and show that now, in fact, what we have is Gaussian distributed with a mean, which will be equal to the constant mean that was for all the random variables. And now we take the variance of each of the random variables, the same constant, and we just divide by m. Okay, and you'll see that. You'll actually see that effect when we're working with the dashboard below. Okay, so we're ready to go. How do we demonstrate the central limit theorem? In order to do this, we're going to have to do Monte Carlo simulation. Very, very straightforward. At its basic foundation, it is simply random drawing from a distribution. Any distribution, just random drawing. And in fact, calculate a CDF, draw a random value uniformly distributed between, between zero and one, do the inverse of the CDF, or you could put all the values in the data set in a hat, draw them out with replacement. That is Monte Carlo simulation. And that's how we're going to go ahead and solve this. We're going to do a bunch of random drawings from the X's in order to do the summations and to demonstrate this. Okay, if you want, I have a lecture linked up above Monte Carlo simulation so you can see the details. All right, you're ready to go. This will work as long as you have Anaconda, the most current version installed. This dashboard should work. Let's go ahead and load up some packages. The purpose of this walkthrough is not go through the code and talk about code. Not here. We're going to spend all our time on the dashboard. So let's go ahead and we'll skip through that. We load our packages. We got a function here in order to improve our gridding to get some nice grid lines. Here's the code for the dashboard. I won't go through it. It's a bit complicated. Um, there's a lot going on. It's, it's a, quite a bit of a plot. But if you want, you can go ahead and look at it and check it out. Let's go down and look at the dashboard right now. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get it perfectly positioned. I think that's a good position right there. Let me explain the plots, and then I'm going to explain the inputs. What we have here is the X PDF. In other words, each of the individual random variables, how are they distributed? In this case, it's uniform, minimum a value of 0.25, maximum value of 0.75. Then what we have is over here is the resulting distribution from the L Monte Carlo simulations from this, where we've drawn M times with replacement from this distribution and taken the average. So we're doing averages. Here's the equation right here. Y is equal to the average of the X's. X's are drawn from here. So we just plot. We do this multiple times and we'll get multiple Y values and we can go ahead and look at how they are distributed. And what I've superimposed on top of here is the Gaussian PDF for with an equivalent mean and standard deviation so that you can see what it would look like if it was Gaussian distributed. You can compare the dashed line and see, in fact, it's not very close. Then what we have down here is I repeated that plot, but I showed the CDF, not the PDF. You have, once again, the solid line is the Gaussian CDF for that same mean and standard deviation observed in the results of the Monte Carlo simulation. The dashed line is the experimental CDF from the data, and this is a cumulative histogram plot, so you can see the bars. And then what we have here is a normal probability plot for y. And what that is, it's a commonly used plot where what we have is the ordered y compared to the theoretical quantiles, and it's scaled such using the Gaussian CDF such that if we had a Gaussian distribution, the points would fall on the line right there, that black line right there. And you can see we have a great amount of departure from Gaussianity so far. We haven't even started trying. Okay, let me explain the inputs. M, how many of these random variables with this distribution do we average? L, how many times do we repeat the M Monte Carlo simulations in order to get 
this L number of averages to look at its distribution. In other words, how many Y values do we look at? And this, these are distribution parameters for the uniform distribution. Okay, let's check one thing first. What happens if the input distribution is Gaussian? What happens if we have a Gaussian, if we start with a Gaussian distribution? And I don't want to have an issue with not having enough samples of Y. So let's go ahead and set L as 1000. Let's max that out. So we have 1000 samples here. So now what we have is we have M equals to one. So all we're basically doing is saying Y is equal to X one. So we're just taking one single value from this drawn randomly from this distribution and we're just plotting we're just taking it and then we repeat that l times so 1000 times we're drawing from this distribution and guess what the result is we get back a gaussian distribution it was already gaussian in fact look we're on the line right there it works out very very well now let's go ahead and change it to a uniform distribution what happens now if we take a single value from this distribution and then we go ahead and we do that 1000 times I hope you can see it in fact you can see it very very clearly with the CDF that's a that's just a, a straight line a CDF with a straight line indicates a uniform distribution this is a little bit noisy it's not perfect but it really is a uniform distribution in other words how is Y distributed if we don't do any averaging or no summations, in other words, we just take M equals one, it retains the original distribution shape. Now, what we saw before is it, re it remains Gaussian if this is Gaussian distributed, but now it's uniformly distributed. The result is uniform distribution. Okay, so we're not, the central limit theorem doesn't work if there's no averaging. We actually need summing or averaging to occur, and that doesn't happen if your number of random variables is equal to one. Now we're gonna increase M to two. When we do that, now what we've done is we've taken one random value from this distribution plus another random value from this distribution, and we sum them divided that by two so we get the average of the result and we plot that then we do it again one draw plus another draw randomly from this distribution sum them divide by m get an average plot it repeat two times average two times average two times average how how is y distributed when we go ahead and repeat that uh, 1000 times look at this distribution Look at the CDF right here and look at the normal probability plot. Now, let me go back and forth. M1, look at that probability plot. And M2, look at that probability plot. Do you see what's happening? Even when we average just M equals 2 random variables with a uniform distribution, which is totally, look at that, totally not Gaussian we already start to converge or get to start to move towards Gaussianity. Let's let M equals three and check that out. Three, look at that. Do you see how it's converging even closer on the normal probability plot for Y? Now, just to, just to make it clear, Y is equal to the average of X1, X2, and X3. And look at that, we're getting even closer. Let me go back and forth a couple times. M equals two, M equals three. Do you see the difference? We're getting even closer. And M equals four, M equals five, M equals six. And by now you can see that we're getting very close. We're basically almost totally on the line. You look at the PDF from the Gaussian distribution. Is There's a little bit of noise in the bar, sure. But in general, we're almost totally matching the Gaussian distribution. The CDF looks, I can't see the difference between the CDFs of the Monte Carlo simulation and the Gaussian distribution for the same mean and standard deviation. So if we take seven random values that are all uniformly distributed and we take the average of them and repeat that 1000 times and we look at the distribution of that, we get the, we are sampling through Monte Carlo, the distribution of Y, where Y is the average of the X's, and we're seeing the central limit theorem we're seeing that we're approaching and Gaussian. It's definitely getting very close. And the larger the M, the closer we get to Gaussian.
Okay, why is this impactful? There's many times that we work with processes in our workflows that involve averaging. In fact, a really nice example or summing, a really nice example of this is when you work with principal components. In fact, what you're doing is you're taking weighted sums of different features and check it out. You'll actually see that your principal components start to see the central limit there. Yeah, yeah, so, so there's lots of cases in machine learning and in data science where we're gonna see the central limit theorem come into play. Okay, I hope this was helpful to you. Once again, I'm Michael Perch. I'm a professor in the University of Texas at Austin and I share all of my educational content online to support my students with evergreen content that outlasts the semester and also support working professionals interested in learning data science. All right, everyone, stay safe.